My name is uh, Art Slagle, and I represent the North American Division for Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries. I cover the Southern Union from Mississippi to Puerto Rico. Uh, I do not vacation in Puerto Rico. If I go to Puerto Rico, it's fly in, fly out. So it's not, go have fun. Uh, I represent all the disciplines of chaplaincy for the denomination in the Southern Union. There are four of us who cover North America. Washington Johnson covers from Virginia to Maine over to beyond Andrews into Wisconsin, and, ca and he covered Canada. I cover the Southeast. We have uh, Ivan Numano who covers from uh, San Diego to uh, Seattle, parts of New Mexico, Louisiana, Guam, Hawaii. Those are the hardship places, as well as um, uh, Bill Cork, who's in Texas and covers up uh, the central states. So four of us cover all of chaplaincy for the North American Division. And uh, it's quite a responsibility to work with over 600 endorsed Seventh-day Adventist chaplains. 600 men and women who are endorsed in chaplaincy. Again, I'm Art Slagle. I have to put it on my shirt so that I remember who I am because I have a twin brother. And uh, thank the Lord he's in Miami and he doesn't bother me in North Carolina anymore. <laughs> but I do have to put my name on a shirt because, you know, he's always asked if he calls, he wants something. Today I'm going to talk about working with veterans. Anybody here a veteran of the military? Uh, gentlemen, what branch did you serve in? The Army. Army. Marine Corps. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Do you know what branch I served in? Do you know what branch I served in? Come on, Semper Fi. Hoorah. Uh, uh, and automatics, of course, is the Marine. You know, once a Marine, always a Marine. You've heard that before? And I thank you for your service in the Army. My, my dad was in the same war you were, in the World War I. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, my dad was in the Army. Uh, in the army. My, my father and my father-in-law were both Army. Uh, in the Army, one was, uh, my father-in-law was a doctor. Uh, my dad was an infantryman uh, during World War II, an Army sergeant. Uh, and you know that Army stands for ain't ready to be a Marine yet, right? Okay. <laughs> And you know that Marine stands for muscles are required, intelligence not expected, right? <laughs> I was uh, standing in Asheville, North Carolina at the airport. I'm in Marine green uniform. I have a loud mouth, so I'm calling all the honor details to attention as the veterans from World War II are coming off of a flight where they had been taken to Washington, D.C., to spend an entire day pampered in Washington, D.C. and coming back. I'm standing next to an Army two-star general, West Point graduate, and I called the group to attention, and we had Civil Air Patrol, we had Cherokee uh, Nation Honor Guard, we had uh, Law Enforcement Honor Guard, so we had about six Honor Guards. I called the group to attention, and the veterans start coming off, and there's pa there are families in a, in a large waiting area as they come through the, through the, uh, the airport. And this old Marine walks up to me and he leans in and he says, Marine Corps, 30 years. I dropped my salute, I shook his hand, I said, Semper Fi. And then I nodded towards the Army two-star general. The Marine leaned in and said, wrong uniform, and he walked on. I asked the general, how does it feel to be dissed by a Marine? And he was okay with that. Our veterans today are in circumstances far different from those of us who may have served in Vietnam. And I, I was a combat Marine in Vietnam. I served in the Marine Corps from 66 to 72. Was a helicopter mechanic and a machine gunner on helicopters in Vietnam, 67, 68. Uh, and I was not a Seventh-day Adventist, okay? Uh, I, actually, I was a, I'm an Orthodox Jew. And uh, so I had uh, six years in the Marine Corps. Um, and the, the way we were treated when we came back from Vietnam was not with open arms and welcoming arms, unlike what we did with the men and women who went to Desert Storm and Desert Shield. Uh, I served as a Navy Marine Corps chaplain for 21 years as well, later on, and 
there was a vast difference. We sent them away with a band and a prayer and Bibles in their hands that God would watch over and keep them. And when they came back, we welcomed them back as men and women who have done a tremendous service for their country, far different from what we had in Vietnam. And I was at Andrews Air Force Base, and the young, two, two young guys were dressed in old combat fatigues. And I said, well, why are you here? Now, I was in Navy uniform at the time. I was a chaplain at Bethesda Naval Hospital, which is now Walter Reed. I said, why are you here? He said, because we want to give them what we never got. And you and I, in everyday experience, have opportunity to interact with those who have served in the military. You know, we've all heard and possibly used the phrase that the church is a hospital for sinners. Have you ever said that? C.S. Lewis, Dear Abby, they've all said that. We may have heard that the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. Anybody hear that? Or the church is not a rest home for saints, it is a hospital for sinners. The one I like the best is a quote from Pope Francis, who was being interviewed in 2013. Let me share what he said. He said, I see clearly that the thing that the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness and proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. A field hospital after battle. And I like that part. You have to heal the wounds. And then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds. Heal the wounds. And you have to start from the ground up. Now, I don't know about what you do in your community churches to interact with veterans. Last uh, few, few months ago, uh, in November, I was up in Syracuse, New York, up at uh, Union Springs Academy, because the pastor of the church said, why don't you come up here and why don't you speak to our veterans in the community? And they invited about 30 or 40 veterans from the community to come in on a Sabbath, special day, have a meal, and, and receive something. They each received a certificate of appreciation. It was handed, it, handed to them by the mayor of the city and the pastor and myself. I gave them a challenge coin. Anybody know what challenge coins are? Anybody ever receive them? You know, it be something like this. We gave them this one. And this one said, this one says an appreciation it says, uh, the saints salute you for your, something service. I can't read it because of the light. And then on the back, it's from our national service organization. So we gave them to each of those men and women who came to be recognized as veterans in a community. Something simple to do in a town. When I was the head chaplain at Park Ridge Hospital in North Carolina, I decided I wanted to do something. So the first thing I did is I did a survey of the staff, 1,100 men and women, and said, how many of you have served in the military? And we had about 60. And so I decided what I was going to do is we're going to start a veterans association for Park Ridge Hospital. And all you have to do is have served in the military. There's no meetings. There's no dues. And so what I did is I had a charter uh, sign made up where they can sign it. And we put that in a frame, and that's in the very foyer of the hospital. So when people come in, they can see this big charter certificate of appreciation for the veterans from Park Ridge Hospital. I gave them a card that identified them as veterans. And I gave them a coin that I had made as well from the hospital in appreciation for their service. I put a bulletin board outside my church, uh, outside of my office, and I had their pictures of when they served in the military. And then I had below that pictures of their family members who are currently serving in the military. It made a big impact on the members of the community and the church to see that appreciation for our servicemen. Have you ever gone up to a serviceman who's, or a woman who's wearing a military hat and say, thank you for your service? Anybody ever do that? Okay. I don't care whether they have actually served or if they bought a hat. I always do that. 
Always do that. Have you ever been in a, in a restaurant and you see a young Marine and his gal come in at the airport and they're going to get a meal? Have you ever paid for a meal for someone else who's a veteran? Some hands here. Why? Because we can do that and show appreciation for what they've done. Remember, how many of you are old enough to remember MASH? <laughs> All you kids. <laughs> okay. Remember the chaplain? Father Mulcahy? Okay. The whirling blades of the chopper opened the familiar scene as a helicopter lands somewhere in Korea. And Father Mulcahy, the chaplain and the television mass journal, he's writing in his mass and his journal that he's waiting for anyone to show up for his 10 o'clock interfaith service. He hasn't given up hope. It's only 11.30. Mulcahy's greatest concern is expressed in his battlefield reflections. He says, I do give last rites to the dying, and now it's called the sacrament of the sick uh, for, in Catholicism. But if only I could do something for the living. That was his concern. What can I do for the living? And you and I know that the men and women who are coming back from combat in Afghanistan, they've come back from Kuwait, they've come back from those, uh, those areas uh, where they have been maimed by explosive weapons that we had punji pits in Vietnam. And they come back and they, they're paraplegics. But they don't give up hope. Their struggles are hard, harder than what you and I can even imagine. There are over three and a half million caregivers giving care to our veterans today who have been wounded warriors since 9-11. Since 9-11. Three and a half million caregivers. Someone said... Today, the battlefield can be anywhere that people face danger, darkness, or despair, or where people simply seek a spiritual voice in a time of need. Has anyone seen the movie Chaplains that's been done by Martin Dobelmeyer? Has anybody seen that? Your conference president should have received that at the year-end meeting about two years ago. Martin Dobelmeyer has done several things on Adventist, uh, about Adventist medical. Uh, he's done a great one on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you've ever seen that. But he did one on chaplains, and he looked at the roles of chaplains and military chaplains, healthcare, law enforcement, corrections, even some guy on the hill called Barry, what's his name? Gary Barry Black. When I was a Navy chaplain, Barry was the chief of chaplains. I remember when he was at the Naval Academy, and I went to visit him. I was a young ensign, went to visit him. And he was off someplace, but I ran into a Catholic priest in 06, and that's in the full bird. And he told me that Barry Black was the best chaplain that he had met in his 20 years in chaplaincy. And, and this was in 06, talking about an 02, a lieutenant, an 03, Barry's a lieutenant. And when he was being selected for flag officer, a vice admiral, a three star, told me that he immediately set Barry's record aside as one of the top three contenders to be the new deputy chief of chaplains and then to be the chief of chaplains. But that movie on chaplains is one that is great for you to take a look at, if you can get an opportunity to see it. Uh, I know we gave it out to the conference presidents. I hope your uh, elder Wright got it. If not, I will see to, that he gets a copy of it because we bought 200 copies of it. But it gives you an opportunity. It was also on um, PB, uh, public broadcasting we saw it before it ever came out. It's like being seen. Hacksaw Ridge. Anybody see Hacksaw Ridge? Yeah, I've seen it three times, you know, twice before it even came out in the theater. You want to see about post-traumatic stress disorder? You look at that movie. If you've seen The Conscientious Objector, you see more of it uh, when the individuals who are part of Hacksaw Ridge are talking. You can see the evidence of PTSD. You can see the dynamic of what what has happened in their lives because of the type of combat that they have fought in. Elma Davis said that this nation will remain the land of the free so long as it is the home of the brave. 
And you and I both know that this is an all-volunteer service, and we still have men and women, Seventh-day Adventist men and women, who are going into the military. I had a call one day. I was in Arizona, in Albuquerque. No, I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at the International Conference of Police Chaplains. And I had a call early in the morning, and the gal said, you gave me your card when you were at the GC, North American Division, and she said, my daughter has joined the Marine Corps and she's leaving for Marine Boot Camp Sunday. This is probably a Friday. Can you pray with my daughter? And I said, absolutely. She woke her daughter up and I prayed with her daughter. When her daughter graduated from Paris Island, I was at the graduation, I got a chance to see the mother. And I found out that in this girl's, in Vanessa's platoon of women Marines, there were eight Seventh-day Adventists. Gathering together on a Sunday morning, because they couldn't get off on Sabbath, but they had two hours to gather together on Sunday morning. There were 20 Seventh-day Adventists, men and women, going through Marine Corps boot camp. This is only three months ago. Some of our church members and their family members are out there. And we need to be connected to them in a very strong way. We need to let them know that we as a denomination, and whether we, we support military and we support them we stand behind them you know we do not encourage men and women to join the military unless I'm looking and trying to recruit chaplains <laughs> then I do but we support them each year Carolina conference at camp meeting does something special to recognize veterans. And I don't know what Georgia Cumberland Conference does, but in Carolina Conference where I live. So each year on Memorial Day, this first day of camp meeting, we have an honor guard that comes in, in uniform, men and women who have served in the, in the armed forces, carrying a flag of their branch of service. And we start that service, that evening's program, with them coming in. We have one of them, uh, and normally there's one or two of us who are chaplains, an Air Force chaplain and myself, and I switch back uniforms, Marine, Navy, Civil Air Patrol, whichever one I'm gonna wear. But we open up with the Pledge of Allegiance and a prayer. And at the conclusion of that night's service, anyone who's a veteran receives a coin from Carolina Conference. I had 100 coins. I had 100 of these coins right here. I had 150 veterans from Carolina Conference, and we're not just saying somebody coming up and get a freebie. Veterans, 150 of them at camp meeting, received a coin. They're in our churches, they're in our community. We need to know what to do with them, how to work with them. Very few, uh, very few veterans consider themselves a charity cases. You know, we have a lot of veterans organizations, people who want to do something for veterans, but veterans organizations, and I belong to a number of them. I'm a lifetime member of the Military Order of the Purple Hearts, Marine Corps League, Papa Smoke Helicopter Association, Vietnam Veterans Association, Veterans of Foreign Wars, but they like to collect money, but they like to use the veterans as part of that way and the means of getting into the community and collecting funds for their organization. And, and I'm not saying that's all wrong, but veterans are not charity cases. Our goal should be to empower veterans to achieve their potential. And you and I have an opportunity as members of a community who can reach out to very large groups of people to engage veterans. And we, we've deal with homeless veterans. We know places where they are. We know how to, to, to give somebody a pair of socks. You know, in my church in Asheville, North Carolina, where I worship, uh, one Sabbath a month, we feed people. 200 people come on a Sabbath morning from between 7 and 9 for food. A good number of homeless veterans are part of that. And what we're doing is we're engaging them and loving them and letting them know that we are there for them in any way that we can be. And we've had people who have followed up, who have come over to our church. We all know that the World War II generations of veterans was called the, great, the greatest generation. In a recent conversation 
with a younger post 9-11 veteran, he shared in a very poignant way that he and so many others feel. He said, we are defined as a generation of PTSD and suicide. We have only a small window left before. That is how America will remember us. My colleague, Bill Cork, I talked to him today. We just had a conference uh, with the North American Division ACM Committee to endorse chaplains today. He told me that just this last week, there were three suicides in his Army Brigade. He's an Army uh, National Guard Reserve chaplain. Three suicides in his Army Brigade. The suicide rate between 18 and 29 year olds is higher in the military than in the regular community. The greatest damage to veterans occurs as the messages of the media are pervaded through national media and social media. And there's got to be ways to fix it. A lot has happened since 9-11. I was teaching, when I retired from the Navy, I was teaching in Virginia, and I was in my classroom, and someone came in and said, you need to turn on the television. And I saw the second plane hit the tower with my students. And then the next thing we know, we had a plane hidden in the um, Pentagon. I have friends who were in the Pentagon at that time. I was a law enforcement and a fire and rescue chaplain for the county at the time, and I was on call to respond to this and the impact of what this had. Shock and awe. You know, he said, we won, we've accomplished the mission. I was at a chaplain's conference and we were interrupted in the conference and told to get back to our commands immediately. This is when Desert Shield started. And we were packed and ready to go within a relatively short period of time. Those represent deployments, seven hash marks. Hash marks. Our men and women today are not deploying one time spending 13 months in Vietnam. They're spending eight months, nine months deployed, coming home for a couple of months and going back, whether it's Afghanistan or someplace else. Seven hash marks on his uniform. We hear what they're saying about veterans, five dead after vet goes mad, voices in his head now. What do people think about us as veterans? I just read something on an email today that uh, one of the gals in the Senate was saying that veterans, that all veterans, you know, are evil and crazy and, and we're all out there to kill people. That is a falsehood. Do we have veterans who are hurting? Absolutely. Do we have veterans who are in need of something? Yes. And I have seen veterans who are in World War II who never spoke about their experiences until someone took the time to sit down with them and just make, make friends with them. And that is, is something that you and I can do. The truth is that veterans are much more likely to be the rescuer than the assailant, said Paul Rykoff. He was an Army infantry platoon leader during his, the invasions of Iraq. There is this lazy stereotype that we come back as damaged souls. Do our veterans have damaged souls? You better believe that, uh, that combat changes individuals. If you've not been there, you may not understand it, but you don't come back the same. And I don't care if you're a hardcore jawhead like we are, but you don't come back the same. Things change. Take a look at this. 2,500 service members deployed. This is since 9-11. 2,500,000. Take a look at this. Are we struggling with issues, mental health, PTSD, PT, um, PTS? Yes, we are. We have brain injuries, lots of things that have changed, lots of things that have challenged us. And we can reach out to men and women and just give them what they need, and that's the assurances that they are accepted, that they are loved. And we can reach out to them spiritually because I run across men and women who need that spiritual dynamic in their lives. And I can, I can tell you, it was a, um, 
and you can read some of these comments. Um, it was a nurse who was taking care of a Marine when I was back in the States. He was the only survivor out of six. It was his nurse who shared the love of God with me. I was an Orthodox Jew. I'm still an Orthodox Jew. Unorthodox, but an Orthodox Jew. I haven't converted. I've completed my Judaism. That's what I tell my rabbi friends. Um, and my boss was a Jewish carpenter. But uh, she shared the love of Christ with me in such a way that I didn't look at her as this beautiful six-foot blue-eyed blonde nurse. I looked at her with an understanding that there was something in my life that I didn't have. And she shared the book Steps to Christ with me. And when I read that book, it made so much sense about relationship with God that I decided I needed to know more. And in 1970, in July 4th, 1970, I was baptized. And in two months, I was at the campus of Walla Walla out of the Marine Corps one week. And I was going to study for the ministry. She didn't say, here's a Jew, let's convert him. She said, here's a, here's a, a veteran, let's work with him. Today, she's a doctor at Loma Linda. 55,000 Purple Hearts since 9-11. 6,905 combat deaths. There were times in Vietnam that we had that within a couple of weeks. And this is what we see. 1,600 plus amputations. This guy on the right-hand side, top right, have you ever seen him in a movie? He was in a movie in, in Hawaii where this, uh, these aliens invade and this one uh, group of ships are in this dome or outside of a dome and everybody else is enclosed. Nobody can get in. And, and he's, he fights the aliens, climbs up a, a big mountain in Hawaii. But actually, he's a double amputee from the, from the, the war. Civilian deaths, 210,000. And that impacts the service member as well to see men and women, children being killed. You know, post-traumatic stress disorder, you've all learned about it today. When I was at Bethesda Naval Hospital, it was at least 20 years before I even looked at Vietnam. I think it was when they opened the wall in Washington, D.C., that I, I went down to the wall by myself. I was pastoring in New York City. I went down to Washington by myself to, for the first time, to talk about Vietnam with other veterans. I never talked to my twin brother. I never talked to my kid brother. Never talked to my father about the experiences. But it took that much time before I would open up and begin to begin the healing process. I confess without shame, I'm sick and tired of fighting. Its glory is all moonshine. Even success, the most brilliant, is over dead and mangled bodies. All the fighting men of our army want peace, and it is only those who have never heard a shot, never heard the shrieks and groans of the wounded and lacerated that cry aloud for more blood, more vengeance, more desolation. Those are some powerful words. And of course, war isn't hell, war is war, and hell is hell, and, the, and of the two, war is a lot worse. How do you figure, Hawkeye? Easy, Father, tell me who goes to hell. Sinners, I believe. Exactly. There are no innocent bystanders in hell. War is chock full of them. Little kids, cripples, old ladies. In fact, except for some of the brass, almost everybody involved is an innocent bystander. What do we do for them? Reintegration. We deal with traumatic brain injury. Reintegration, there's disorientation, there's disconnection, there's withdrawal, there's confusion, there's communication and adjustment. When I deployed with the Marines, we had pre-deployment briefings for the Marines and for their families. And before we came back from a deployment, we had, -de we had post deployment briefings for the Marines and their families so that when they came back from where we were, they can integrate back into a home environment where they had been missing for quite some time. You don't walk in the door, slam it open, drop your pack, I'm here and I'm in charge again. It doesn't work that way. And if your spouse is still there, you're lucky. 
If she's not, you're lucky. Sometimes. I came back from a deployment and a spouse of 25 years was already having an affair with somebody else from the church. Total shock. But this is what we go through. We go through, if, if you can have a honeymoon, <laughs> um, we go through these things in the reintegration process. So what do we deal with? We deal with the honeymoon. We deal with the conflict, the culture shock, the recovery adjustment. I was home from Vietnam three days, and I'm at a Marine Corps base in California. And early in the morning, I'm in the barracks. I was a Marine sergeant or a Marine corporal at the time. I hear this kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. There were eight of us in that barracks at the time, and we hit the door at the same time looking for the bunker. And there wasn't one there. But we were reacting to something that was ingrained in us. We realized at the time it was only a salute for someone who was retiring. But you know, the impact of combat can hit us at any time. I had been flying with a Marine uh, colonel, a uh, combat engineer, we're flying in the mountains of California, and I'm thinking, man, we're in a helicopter, I'm thinking, this is just like being back in Vietnam. And we had a long day. We arrived back on a ship, and I'm in a room with three Marine captains. Normally I have my own room, but this time I was with three Marine captains. We got in, it was, it was probably about you know, 11 o'clock at night, 2300 for you, you, you Marine military guys. Just drop your clothes, turn the light off, and hit the rack. And we did that. And I get in this bunk bed, and the lights are out, and it, it's 30 seconds into being in bed, and someone says, man, it's dark in here. Immediately, I felt claustrophobic. I felt like I was having everything closed in on me, and I couldn't figure out why. I'd been in a small room on a ship when I was a cruiser chaplain, never had a problem. I walked the deck of that ship all night long, feeling closed in, even outside. I almost went to Paul Kyle, who was a colonel, and said, Paul, you need to pray for me because I'm going crazy. And I just couldn't put a, a hand on it. What was happening to me? I made it through that night without jumping over the side of the ship. And I'm being honest. I really thought I was going crazy. I just felt it. But it wasn't until later on that I finally put it all together. What was that room like? It was just like being back in a bunker in Vietnam. The smell, the darkness, and you know, when you, when you have incoming rockets, you hustle into the first protection. It was just like being back in that. So I wasn't going crazy. I was just having remembrances of combat situations. Traumatic brain injury. We have a lot of this today. And it impacts our men and women. The signature injury of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. More than 50% of injuries sustained during the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan are the result of explosive in explosives, including bombs, grenades, landmines, mort mortar, artillery, shells, and improvised explosion devices, or IEDs. Since 2006, blasts have been the most common cause of injury among American soldiers treated at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. That includes Bethesda Naval Hospital. Anybody see this movie? It's Will Smith about football players and brain injuries? Yes. He plays a doctor who's convinced that the impact of those hard hits cause brain injuries, and we know today that that's valid, but there was a movie based on that. Traumatic brain injury, this is what we, t we deal with. Look, 5,000 penetrating brain injuries, 3,600 severe, 31,000 moderate, 286,000 mild brain injuries, and 21,000 not classifiable, 347,000. What are the men out there in, on our streets of uh, the Georgia Cumberland Conference dealing with, some of them are dealing with this. And some of the, some of the signs, slow to answer questions, dizziness or vertigo, irritability, easily upset, sleeping more than usual. And these are things that can happen because of other things in life. You don't have to be in combat. You can go through any kind of post-traumatic stress disorder and have these same indicators going on. Combat and operational stress. These are the movies that we've probably all seen. 
All Quiet on the Western Front, Rambo, and of course Tom Cruise in Born on the Fourth of July, and of course now Hacksaw Ridge. Desmond Doss went through post-traumatic stress disorder for quite some time. Anybody know Desmond Doss? Okay, a few people. Uh, one of the uh, members of my church, uh, Harold Schutte, is was Desmond Doss's wife's brother, and you know his first wife. Um, I've been working with, uh, with the Desmond Doss Foundation uh, for a period of time now and just working to help let people know what one individual could do. And you have to remember, as he was going in to save lives, what was the rest of his platoon doing and company? They were fighting to protect him, number one. fighting to protect him, risking their lives so that he could do his job. PTSD, exposure to actual threat and death, serious injury or sexual violation. You know, we, we've probably all learned about it, but we should read more about post-traumatic stress disorder because it's not just our veterans that go through this. It's individuals in your church who may have been sexually abused. It's individuals in your church who may have been in an accident and every time they go past a certain place on the expressway, something comes back to them. Moral injury. Moral injury is present when there has been a betrayal of what's right, either by a person or legitimate authority. Moral injury is a big thing that we're dealing with, with the men and women who've served, our veterans who are in the community. Some of the examples, using deadly force in combat and causing the harm of death of civilians knowingly but without alternatives or accidentally. You know, the guy who drops bombs from an airplane doesn't see the, the dynamics of what has been done. They just know that they did their job and that was it. But those ground pounders, men and women, today, it's a whole different dynamic. So we look at post-traumatic stress disorder, moral injury, See some of the dynamics of that. Do you think this is a problem today? It's been a problem in our academies, not our military academies. It's been a problem in our churches because we deal with those kind of issues. That's the invisible war. And I thought, look, 67% of females didn't report it. 81% of the males didn't report it. What's our responsibility for the men and women that we have, that we interact with? Whether it's within our church or whether it's in the community. We have a responsibility to care for them, to bring healing to them. Death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what dies inside us while we what? Live. What happens when you get home and realize you, would never, you will never be this awesome again? What's the differences in these masks? On the right, hate, fear, guilt, remorse, pain. We are not going to meet the needs of every one of our veterans that we encounter. Some of them will say, just leave me alone. But we have opportunities to do simple things to reach out and impact their lives when we can. And we, your pastors, your ministers, when the conference president calls and says, how many, you can turn the camera off. <laughs> how many people are you going to baptize? I might say a thousand, I might say zero. Because it's up to the Holy Spirit to bring people in. In pastoral ministry, in a, in a chaplain I was interviewing down in Florida Hospital, he told me in pastoral ministry, you're there to convert people and build church membership. In chaplaincy, you're there to converse with people, meet them where they are in their faith journey. So our ministry as chaplains is to facilitate ministry for all faiths without compromising our faith. So whether the person's a Baptist, Methodist, or agnostic, it makes no difference. 
We're there to facilitate ministry for them in their faith journey. They want to become Seventh-day Adventists and know who we are. Absolutely great. We share that. But as chaplains, we're not there to build church membership. We're there to reach people and share the love of Christ where they are in their journey. The agnostic who says, I believe in the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule, but I'm an agnostic. So I asked her, I said, can I pray with you? She said, sure. And I prayed with her before surgery. She came back a month later for surgery, and I said, she said, you remember me? I said, sure. You're the agnostic who believes in the Golden Rule and the Ten Commandments. Can I pray for you? She said, sure. We just simply met her where she was. Well, the Jehovah Witnesses said, I don't want to pray, but how about we share favorite Bible passages? And as a chaplain, I could do that. I did that before his surgery. What do we deal with? What do you see? Sometimes within the veteran, there's an altar individual who just doesn't like themselves. And so we do what? We see them taking alcohol more and more. We see women. It's not just guys. It's women as well. Some men dream of being a hero. Others relive it in their nightmares. Suicide. In 2011, 52 in the Navy, 32 in the Marine Corps, 50 in the Air Force, 167 in the Army. Look at the Army numbers in comparison to the other services. One is a loss. One is a loss. So look at those numbers. Between 2001 and 2011, men and women, veterans who've committed suicide, we had the chief of naval operations commit suicide. And my first thought, my first thought when I heard that, where was his chaplain? Where was his chaplain? And, you know, Abraham Lincoln one time said he was the most miserable, he believed he was the most miserable person on earth. And he was in such severe depression for six months. He, he couldn't understand how people can live that way. And he's a strong man of faith. Suicide among veterans and other Americans. Those are the statistics. We have to, in our opportunities to reach out and touch the lives of people, we have to give them something. I was doing a lecture we well, giving a talk to about a thousand Marines in the big amphitheater in California. And I asked how many people know people who attempted suicide? A lot of hands went up. These are Marines. How many know people who uh, committed suicide? A lot of hands went up. How many people have thought about suicide? Hands went up. I asked one question. I said, why? Why do they commit suicide? And this young Marine, she was in the very far back of the, the, the audience, and she said, because they have no hope. You bet I made sure that I talked with her after that lecture to let her know that there is hope. Is a suicide prevention lines, journeys of healing. For post-traumatic stress treatment, we do medicine, psychotherapy, comprehensive soldier fitness. We try and reach them where they are and enable them. And it's easy for us. We can do things such as going to a hospital and interacting with veterans who are there for, for some treatment. Bring a cup of coffee to a veteran. Sit down and talk to a veteran's pa a family while they're there. We can do things to reach out to veterans where they are and offer them some hope. We don't have to offer 28 fundamental beliefs. I had a chaplain call the office in Washington, D.C., or in Maryland. 
He's a corrections chaplain in Florida, not an Adventist. He said, I've got an Advent, a guy who says he's an Adventist. He got convicted over the internet that he should become an Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist. He's an Adventist, and I want to know how I can minister to him. And he says, you know, I know about the 27 fundamental beliefs. I said, wait a second, there's 28. We've added one. <laughs> but he was there to facilitate ministry for people, no matter what their faith background was. When I get down to Florida, I'm going to go visit with that chaplain, that corrections chaplain, as I make my tour around. Adaptive disclosure. Treatment starts but cannot finish. The more repair repairs. You know, one of the things I do as a veteran, and I did as a chaplain, the head chaplain of a hospital, I couldn't go talk to my chaplains. So I would go and find someone that I can talk to, and I, I didn't do groups. I did groups one time, and some guy says, how can you as a chaplain kill people? I said, wait a second, time out. As a Marine, I did what I did as a Marine. What I do as a chaplain is totally different. And after a while, I just said, I don't need that. But I find that I have to go talk to somebody, and I, I would hope that you do in ministry. You find somebody you can confidentially talk to and just process things. You know, I used to go into a Marine First Sergeant's office. <laughs> Oh, if my colonel saw that, he would have died. I go into the first sergeant's office, and, and the colonel and I were good friends. He retired as a three-star general, and he runs toys for tots for the whole Marine Corps now. But I go into the first sergeant's office, I said, can I come in for a second? He said, sure. So I close the door, and I yell at the top of my lungs. Just scream. And I'd say, thank, I needed that. <laughs> and I'd leave. You know, he thinks I'm a little bit mishugana. But periodically, I had to do that. But you know, today, if I find to, I go, there's, I go to a counselor and say, hey, look, I need to deprocess. I need to debrief what I'm dealing with, what's going on. I couldn't do that with my chaplains, but I can go someplace safe and do that. Veterans need to know there are safe places for them to go. And the church can be a safe haven for the men and women um, in our community. So what are you going to do? You can do any number of things in your church community. Recognize veterans. Appreciate them. Invite veteran groups to come into your church for a special program of recognition. You know, what do we do in the veteran groups and the, v uh, the veterans of foreign wars? The guys sit around, they drink beers, and they tell war stories, and they embellish. Bring them someplace else where you can show them something different but to let them know that they're appreciated. I still get together with guys that I flew with in 1967 and 68. Every two years there's a large group and every other year there's a smaller group. I did that in Jacksonville, Florida when I went down to visit two of my Navy chaplains. To stay connected. People want to be connected and you and I have an opportunity to connect people from our churches. Going out, finding where the needs are and doing something about it. Not with the intent to make them Seventh-day Adventist, but with the intent to share the good news of the gospel and to extend the healing ministry of Jesus to men and women. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. You see a veteran, say thank you. Shake their hands if they will. Let them know you appreciate them. One of the things I do, and you may as pastors have veterans who are in your churches and they pass away. One of the things that I have done is I have purchased a coin. And it's a coin that says in recognition, memory, the United States and honor United States service members. And it's got a folded flag on it. And then it talks about the service honoring the passing of an individual for service to a great nation. And I give one of these to any family of a veteran that I, I do a service or may not participate in, but might be in the congregation or in the audience or at the cemetery. Or whatever. I give them one of these coins to let them know that we, as American people, appreciate who they are and what they've done. And you can buy these, you can get these online. You can get them even specifically for Marines if you want to do one for specifically for Marines, but this is generic. There are so many simple things we can do. Any questions? Any problems? Any issues? 
Hit the deck. <laughs> Tension on deck. Thank you. Appreciate you folks allowing me a few minutes of time. And I know that uh, this is a great conference um, to, to work in. And I appreciate what you, you do in, in your pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be in the back. Somebody have a question or anything. Somebody need my card. I've got uh, plenty of cards. Again, I represent all chaplains in all the disciplines for the Southern Union. And I'd be glad to talk to anybody here um, yeah. about what we do. All right, thank, thank you so much. Thank you.